family of servant missionaries. But you guys know that here this morning. For those of you that are joining us live all over the world, no, I'm sure maybe just a few of you from Madison, but uh, we're, we're glad you guys are here this morning. And um, we've been doing a series, you know, we started the series last week on forgiveness. And so we started the message and um, Pastor opened up with just explaining forgiveness that, hey, we have been forgiven. And what a great... Um, privilege that it is to be able to say that God has wiped away all of our sins, that He doesn't think of us any longer in the position of our of our sin, but He He thinks of us as sons and daughters. He's adopted us. He's given back full restoration to us. And so um, then He challenged us all in forgiveness. If we've been forgiven by the Father, if our sins have been wiped clean, then the challenge is that we should forgive others. Um, and I know that comes sometimes with a difficult. It's difficult to, to think about. Oh, I have to forgive those that have trespassed against me, those who, that have wronged me. So this morning, we're hoping that as we talk about forgiveness, we're going to again look at some some scripture and hopefully challenge us and give us some practical ways that we could step and take steps towards uh, forgiving others. Because we know um, around Christmas time, sometimes uh, for most of us, maybe uh, Christmas time is a fun time. It's a time of excitement. It's a time, hey, we remember that moment that we got that birthday uh, or that Christmas present. We opened up our favorite thing. I can remember back watching like VHSs of us uh, opening up our favorite Christmas gifts. One of the ones that I remember receiving was a boom ding. Uh, anyway, I saw that on a VHS one time. My first little drum set that I received was um, a little Fisher Price plastic. Um, boom ding, I called it every day when I opened up. And so I remember watching that as a kid. But there's, a, there's some exciting memories, but also sometimes there's memories that are hurtful. Sometimes uh, family situations that aren't great, or that one fan member that we get together during the holidays and it always brings up turmoil. You know, so we, we want to be a church that is full of forgiveness because the word says, remember, that the Father would not be able to forgive us if we aren't able to forgive those that, uh, that have wronged us. So let's this morning look at Matthew chapter 18, and um, we're going to we're going to go into uh, a little bit of a parable who Jesus is, or, uh, a parable that Jesus told about forgiveness. We're also going to look at a few scriptures that remind us uh, about forgiveness. But then we're going to get a little practical today and say, okay, what will it take? How? What are some steps we can take to forgive? Because uh, hopefully we don't just learn about forgiveness. And all the great things about it, you know, I could preach and we could all, we could teach series and we could read books about forgiveness, but it really doesn't help us at all. It doesn't really change anything unless we start taking some steps towards uh, forgiving those who have hurt us. So this morning, um, let's look here at Matthew chapter 18. This is a, a, a maybe a familiar passage of scripture, uh, a familiar story. But uh, let's look at Matthew chapter 18. We're going to start in verse 21 this morning. It's the parable of the unmerciful servant. And uh, if we, as we learned this morning, there was a great uh, debt that he owed that was forgiven him. And yet sometimes we see, I, I see myself in this servant where those things have been greatly forgiven, those things have been totally wiped clean in my life. I sometimes hold smaller things against those who are around me. So let's read this morning, um, Matthew chapter 18, starting in verse 21, it says this, Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to 70 times. And we know that when he's, when uh, Peter is saying this, he's saying up to 70 times, you know, he's, he's getting, doing a little attaboy. He's, he's like, I know 70 is a really good number, Jesus. So I'm going to throw out 70. It's even a, even a good number in the, in, in the Jewish to say seven, you know, it's a whole number, it's a great number, and I'm going to 70 times, Jesus, that's a really good amount. And Jesus answers them and tells them, not seven times, but 77 times. So he multiplies this out, and to Peter, I'm sure in the moment, he's like, well, I really thought I had the right answer. Anybody else identify with Peter? Sometimes Peter, if we read the Gospels, you see Peter's always throwing out what he thinks is good answers, and then Jesus comes back to him. Sometimes he gets it right. Jesus, you are the, the son of the living God, right? Uh, but then other times he, he's like, Peter, man, you need a little bit of help. You need a little bit of courage. This is another one of those moments. He's like, no, it's not just 70 times, Peter. It's 77 times. It's much more that you should forgive those who, offend, uh, who have offended you, those who have wronged you. And then he begins to tell a story about the kingdom of heaven. And so in verse 23 it says this, 
Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. Verse 24, as he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, servant, at this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. I was researching a little bit, um, you know, what amount of money this was, 10,000 bags of gold. I said, that's a, that's a lot of, that's a lot of gold. I, I was, I do some um, e-trading and, and things, so I, I like watching silver and gold prices and seeing where they're at, you know, I'm like, I had 10,000 bags of gold. It doesn't say how many ounces or how much it weighed. Uh, some people would say, though, that maybe this would represent around a, a billion dollars worth of gold if we were to have that same bag of gold right here today. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a lot of money. It's a, if I think about my college debt, that's nowhere near that amount of, of debt. But this is, this is tens of thousands of times more than what any of us in this room would owe. It's a big amount. And at the, at the moment of the servant begging, at the moment of the servant asking, there was mercy shown on his behalf. But let's look at 28 to see how the servant reacts in this. It's, it's verse 28. But when the servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. I was, uh, our first pastor actually was in um, Missouri. Rachel and I helped start a, a restart a little church in Conway, Missouri. And I remember one of the amazing moments for me was there's an older gentleman in the church that uh, had been coming for a while, and I remember the moment, this older gentleman, maybe in his early 60s, and uh, I remember the first day he called me pastor, it was like amazing, I was like, wow, I, I, I earned this, you know, we've been there for a while, and now all of a sudden, now I'm pastor Andrew, not just Andrew, the young guy from the college coming up and preaching every Sunday, but then I remember one of the precious gifts that he gave Rachel and I, he brought us to his, his house, and one of the times he was, him and his wife were feeding us dinner, he brought out some silver coins, and he said, here, uh, Rachel and Andrew, I would like you guys to have this. And he gave us a silver coin. I was like, oh, great. You know, and that, at that point, I didn't know how much it was worth. I was like, I don't, I don't know. I wasn't going to, uh, like, get all excited about the worth, but just the value. I know that he, he gave it to me. He was saving these things up. But, you know, as I, again, said earlier, I, I started to trade and do some things, gold and silver. And I'm like, okay, I know this, this silver coin uh, costs anywhere between 16 and $23 for little ounce of ounce of silver so here's here's this uh, servant going after just got a forgiven 10,000 bags of gold and he goes after his servant that owes him just a hundred silver coins maybe twenty three hundred dollars who knows what the weight of those silver coins were and he grabbed this man and began to choke him and said pay back what you owe me he demanded his fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him be patient with me, and I will pay it back. Almost mirroring exactly what he had just told the king. But he refused. Instead, he went off, and the man threw and threw him into prison until he could pay the debt. When other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged at what outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called to the servant, You wicked servant, he said, I canceled all the debt of yours because you begged me to, shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all that he owed. This is how my heavenly Father will treat you unless you forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. And so this is a tough thing. This is a tough place that, that uh, we left off last week. Again, this story bringing up this point this is exactly how my Heavenly Father will treat you unless you forgive your brothers from your heart. And so we, we know this is a difficult subject to talk about. But the reality of it is that we know that if we do not forgive those from our heart, then the Heavenly Father cannot forgive us. The, the debt that He has forgiven us is far greater than anything that we've gone through or faced in our life so far. And when I say that, it's, it's sometimes it's a... I don't say that unaware of the different situations that may be represented in this room or those who are listening. 
I remember the first time I spoke on forgiveness, and I was at, at Bible college, and I went to my professor, and I was talking to him, and we were talking through this issue of sin, and how sin is destructive, and sometimes it, it hurts, and, it, and I receive hurts, and I was getting ready to, to preach um, for a senior chapel, and, and he, spoke to, he spoke to me, and he said, Andrew, make sure that in your message that you're aware that there are some people in the room that have gone through something that you haven't. What about those who have gone through abuse in their lives? What, if, what about those who have gone through divorce, have, have uh, gone through broken relationships, those that have faced far worse uh, circumstances than you have? And I said, I, 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 need, I need that reminder to say I understand, and to say in this moment even, that I, I don't claim to understand everything that people have gone through, but I do understand that hurts in our lives are real. That they, we do feel these are real feelings, these are real emotions, these are real circumstances that we've gone through. But the reality is the truth that the, the scriptures points to us is that the, the forgiveness that the Father gives us is far greater, it's far beyond any hurt, any experience, any uh, hurt that we've gone through in our lives. Any unforgiveness that you bear, the Lord has given you more forgiveness than that which you have uh, had hurt against. And so he says to us, he's forgiven us the penalty of death. He's forgiven us the destruction of our lives. He's forgiven us. He's removed that penalty from our lives. He said, now you go and, and do the same thing. Do it and do it from your heart. So if we're going to look at uh, forgiving people, we must also look at right unforgiveness. What, what is that like? So let's turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Because the reality is, when we aren't walking in the character of the Father, if we're not walking after Him and, and acting in His ways, then uh, the, the penalty or the opposite of walking in the Father's way is walking in the way of the enemy. And so we have to be careful here. If we're going to hold unforgiveness, if we're going to choose in, inside of us not to forgive, not to act as the Father has acted, it, uh, we're, we're treading on... We're treading on thin outs. We're heading down a wrong path. We're heading down a treacherous way. And here in Ephesians chapter 4, it begins to give us a little bit of light um, and says it in words maybe that I'm not always as bold to say, but I love Paul. Paul likes to say things how it is. So in Ephesians chapter 4, here we're going to look in verse 26, he he brings up a point he said, about this forgiveness thing. And, and this is why it's so important for us as a body, for us as believers, to get this forgiveness thing right. Because this is what it says in Ephesians chapter 4, starting in verse um, 26. It says this, In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. That's a, that's a really important line there. Do not give the enemy, do not give the devil a foothold. See, what, what we find is with forgiveness, or specifically unforgiveness, when we have choose not to forgive those who have trespassed against us, those who have hurt us, we're actually giving the enemy a foothold in our life, a, a place of anger, a place of bitterness he holds against us because we're acting outside of the character of God. So God would say, hey, I have forgiven that person. And many times we find, sometimes we'll talk about this a little bit later, that the hard part is that we don't want to forgive because we, we want them brought to justice. And so we think that if we forgive them, then that's going to release them of the offense that they've given to us. And so we, we would rather hold on to that offense. We would rather not forgive them because we know, hey, at least I, I, got, a little bit of, I got a little bit of ground with them. I got a little one-up with them. Like, I, I, I can at least hold them captive. Nobody else is going to hold them accountable. At least I'm going to. And when we do that, when we have that, when we keep that anger inside of us, and when we keep that betrayal of what they have done inside of us, it says this, Paul says in Ephesians 4, don't, don't do that. Don't let it go down on you. Don't let the sun go down. Don't let time pass on you. Because if you do, it's going to give a foothold to the, to the devil. In verse 28 it says, Anyone who has been stealing must not steal no longer, but must work. Do something useful with their hands what they may have something to share with those in need. Verse 29, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for the building up of others according to the needs that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with, with whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. 
So it's again, uh, Paul is talking here to the people he's talking to, acting opposite of what you did when you were under the control of the enemy. Before you came to Christ, you acted one way, and he's saying, hey, act in opposite of that. If you're stealing, give give away. If if you have unwholesome talk, then that's that's been a habit of your hey, only use talk and conversation that's going to uplift everybody. And then in verse 31, it says this. Get rid of bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ forgave you. So again, it connects this moment where it's talking about, don't give a foothold for the enemy. It, it goes through stealing, it goes through unwholesome talk, it, and then it gets into the, the really nitty-gritty stuff of unforgiveness, don't get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger. When we talk about rage, when we talk about bitterness, when we talk about unforgiveness, these things take root in our hearts. It has caused a foothold for the enemy, and it causes bitterness, it causes anger, it causes malice within us, and it rises up and it spews out of us. Have you ever seen somebody that holds unforgiveness uh, in their hearts? When they're somebody that's been hurt a, a million times by everybody, and they they there's they have issues. There's issues of anger. There's issues of malice. Their their bodies are even uh, messed up. Pastor even talked about studies last week that said they, that that doctors have done studies on um, arthritis and human nature and found that even there's a correlation between unforgiveness and the pain of the arthritic feels in their bones and in their joints. It it's deep rooted bitterness. Because we don't want, right? We don't want them to get away with what they've done to us. We want to hold on to that. And when we do that, we're actually taking, we're actually taking an alliance. We're actually coming in agreement with the enemy. We actually would rather that person be jailed, be, be captured, be, be thrown away for what they've done, rather than them to receive the grace and the forgiveness and the mercy that God's given them. I believe, one, I believe that it, it shows our lack of understanding of what we've been forgiven. When we're unable to release forgiveness to somebody, we really don't understand where we've once stood, or maybe even sometimes still stand, bet between us and God. That God is a holy and awesome judge. He's a just God. And He has every right to hold us against the penalty of death. But he looked at us even while we were worth nothing, even while we were messed up in our sins, even when we were in a low position, and he looked at us and he said, I find value in you. I would rather have a relationship with you. I would rather be restored to you than to see you dead and forever. That I want to send my only son to die upon a cross, to die the death that each one of you deserved, that Andrew, you deserved this morning. I deserve this death. But you know what? He sent his son so that I would be forgiven. He said, you're worth it to me. And when, we, and when we say that we would rather hold unforgiveness in our heart towards somebody, we're saying that, that they have less value to us than God says of them. We're speaking in contrast to God, what He has spoken over each one of our lives and each one of those who have hurt you. Let's look at Hebrews 12, 14, and 15, because this thing of giving a, the devil a foothold in our lives, it goes even further than just affecting our lives. I have friends that, that uh, I know that are going through some difficult things, that people have wronged them in their lives, and they, they've held it against us, and, and they've even confessed, hey, it's a hard thing if I ever forgive, because I know it's going gonna, it's gonna to cause some, uh, some releasing, it's going to give her, I don't want to give them a go-free card, but then as they talk, and as maybe you've been around those people that have bitterness in their heart, have unforgiveness in their heart, Sometimes you get drawn into that, right? So in Hebrews, we look at Hebrews chapter 12. Here we see this really important passage continuing this understanding of what happens here when we hold this unforgiveness in our hearts. In Hebrews chapter 12, we're going to look at verse 14 this morning. It says this, Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy, Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. I mean, that's motivation in my heart to forgive others. Man, I want to be clean. I want to have a clean heart. I want to be clean before the Lord. In verse 15 it says, See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God, 
that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and to defile many. So what we find about this, when we give the enemy foothold in our lives, it affects, it affects us. I mean, we have bitterness, we are angry, we are unable to forgive, we're sometimes unpleasant. But also that, that unforgiveness, it affects many. It, it, the roots of the enemy, footholds of the enemy, man, they, they affect many. It, it meant other people's opinions of that person now are changed and transformed. Man, when I when I come against somebody, man, they, they feel that that pain, and the people around me then get to wallow in what I'm going through, and they, they're affected. My happiness is, is lowered, so then other people around me, happiness is lowered. Man, the foothold of the enemy doesn't isn't just a personal thing. Sometimes we think that about forgiveness. Well, it's just, man, it's just between me and him, me and, me and her, me and him, this, this situation, that it's just going to affect me. But no, uh, when, we give the football, when we give the enemy a football, when we give the enemy a place of authority in our life, especially in the area of unforgiveness, man, it's a bitter root that causes the defilement of many. Other people are affected by my decision not to forgive. But when we say the flip side of that, my decision to forgive also may affect many others. Bring blessings to relationships. So I think we know first, and we have to decide in our heart first, uh, are we going to be obedient to the Father? That He has forgiven me, and now my, op my opportunity is to forgive. To get rid of the bitter root, to get rid of this in my heart, this thing that I find against them. But there are some, some misconceptions about forgiveness, right? I talked about this. Is, is, mis is forgiveness, are, are we just... You know, giving a, 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 them a free card? Are we just giving them, you know, we're talking about these serious offenses, abuse and neglect and things of that nature. Are we just supposed to give them a free card? Oh, just let them and just do whatever? Well, I would say this, I would start this off in all areas of forgiveness. Forgiveness is about bringing restoration to relationship. However, we're going to go through with a few things. Is, no, there, there are a few things that forgiveness is not. We're not just good giving people a free card to, to re-abuse. And, and there are some things that we as a church want to come alongside if there's some hard situations that you're even currently going through to bring restoration and, and to bring some wisdom into that. But there is something, the forgiveness is not an, an automatic, immediate regaining of trust. So I say, hey, I forgive you um, for the situation, the way you've hurt me. Okay, now we're going to be buddy-buddy and hey, we're all going to go out to steak dinner and have a party together next week. Uh, there are, there is some continue forgiveness is a process of restoration that begins with a choice. We're going to go over that. It begins with a choice to be obedient to the Father. Um, it's, it's not all. It's also forgiveness. It's not also a removal of consequences. Right, so there's sometimes even uh, there's some American laws, some child abuse situation, and things like that. There isn't a there isn't a removal of consequences of things. There there is a something that has been done, an abuse that has been done, we're choosing from our soul to forgive them, to release them, and give them to God's hands for what they have done, but there's also still some legal ramifications for some, for some things that need to be forgiven of. So we're saying, we're, in the spirit, we're saying we're forgiving you, but there are sometimes still some consequences. It isn't just a removal of the consequences of things that have been done. It's also uh, not an ignoring of the offense. So we're not just saying, uh, when somebody will come to me and say, hey, uh, Andrew, would you forgive me? It's not, I'm, it, our response isn't just, oh, it's okay. Nothing, nothing really happened. Or when, we're, when we're, we're forgiving, then we're not just saying, oh, nothing happened. No, the reason why forgiveness needs to take place is because there was an offense. So don't ignore the fact that, hey, this, this is an offense. This is something that I hold against you. This, this is a hurt that I have in my life. I'm not saying this morning ignore that, but no. Um, when we go to them, we have to go and say about forgiveness. We have to acknowledge that there was something that was wrong. There was something that had been wrong. If there was nothing that had been wrong, if nothing, no offense had taken place, then no forgiveness is needed. So we can acknowledge it is okay to acknowledge the hurt that we have so that we can then step forward in forgiveness. It's also, last one, what forgiveness is not. It's not leveraged power. Right? So we're not leveraging this moment against somebody. Oh, you offended me, so now you owe me this. The king didn't do that. 
the king didn't say, hey, you, you owe me this 10,000 things, so I want to forgive the debt, but you will have to come to me uh, once a day for the rest of your life, you know, in restitution for this, this thing. No, uh, uh, forgiveness is not leverage. It's not a, a bargaining power. No, when we forgive somebody, we're fully releasing them of the guilt of the situation. You know, sometimes we, got, we have to remember that um, in marriage situations, right? Maybe uh, for the, the, those of us that are married in the room, man, remember that last time you did this to me and we kind of hold that, that thing? No, if we've forgiven the offenses of those that, that have hurt us, no, we're releasing them completely of that offense, of that wrong, saying it's no more. Thinking also in our relationships. It's not leveraging power. Forgiveness is not what is it not? It's not automatic regains of trust. It's not removal of consequences. There's still consequences for, for things, especially when we're getting in the area of abuse. It, it's not ignoring the offense. No, it, it, there is an offense there. That's why we need to forgive. And it's definitely not a leveraging power. It's not saying, hey, I, I want to remove this debt for you so that you do this. No, it's, a, it's bringing full relationship. Full relationship. It's full. For instance, the, the word says that God, remember, He removes our sins as far as the east is from the north. They never meet. He doesn't hold an account against us of the things that we have done. Jesus is wonderful in this, right? We learn in our relationship with the Father that we have been justified. We're like, that's a nice word, but. It's just as if we never sinned. He restores a relationship with just as if we've never sinned. That is an amazing, <coughs> amazing view of our understanding of forgiveness. Man, that, that I stand before him free. Free from anything that I've ever done. And I want my forgiveness when I forgive others to look the same way. That I would not hold against them the offense any longer. But that truly from my heart I would do that. So how, how do we start this road? How do we get to this road? How do we actually get to the point of forgiveness? How do we do this? Because if we're real, right, there's emotions that stop us sometimes from forgiving. So first thing is that forgiveness is a choice. It starts with a choice. I choose to forgive. And so if we know, if we break, if we can break down our bodies and depending on different school of thought, I believe that we are mind, will, and emotion. Right? Our... It, our soul, that's who we are, our mind, will, and emotion, and it starts from that place to make up my mind, to make a decision of my mind, I choose to forgive so-and-so. I choose to forgive my wife, I choose to forgive my teacher, I choose to forgive my professor, I, I choose to forgive my mother, or I choose to forgive my father, I choose to forgive that stranger on the bus, I choose to forgive. It's a choice of my will to say, I desire my life so much to reflect the forgiveness that I received from the Father, I'm choosing this day to forgive you. It starts with a decision to say, I choose. And sometimes our emotions are with us. Sometimes our emotions are like, yeah, I want to go with it. But sometimes I don't. Sometimes they lag behind. It's kind of like a train. The first part of the chain, the engine, right, is the decision, I choose to forgive you. And I want to believe that as I make this decision to forgive, that my emotions are going to follow along. That, that eventually it's going to be, it's going to, I'm going to start with this decision and eventually it's going to get to the point where I can actually look at somebody in the face and say, I love you. I find it strange, there's hard, when I think about, um, there's a song that was made about forgiveness. And the story of the song was that there was a mother who had sent their the daughter out and the daughter was hit by a drunk driver and, and the, the driver of the car was sentenced to, to prison and the mother was there from a believing family and they had to make this decision what to do with this. They knew that they had been forgiven much. They, they had memorized all the good scriptures. They, they were in church every Sunday. They were a part of the church body. They're good Christian people, right? I said, but now this man then he took the, the life of my daughter, teenage daughter, Cut it short. Could it, uh, imagine that moment that, you know, the emotions that are there, the sadness, the, the anger, all of those things, and she made the decision to forgive. And so at the moment, it wasn't easy. It wasn't like it was like this, okay, boom, yeah, let's do it, yay. You know, that's the next, next thing up on the agenda. No, it was, a, it was a tough decision to make. But as she released forgiveness to this man, the, the grace of God was also evident. So it's interesting in our lives, and as we say this, 
as we walk in the character of God, the reason why we do so is not just because we, we want to look like God, and I believe we do as we walk in His character, right? We look like Him. But then as we look like Him, then others get to experience His character also, right? It's not just about me, it's about them. So as they release forgiveness to this man, he all of a sudden becomes overwhelmed with the mercy that's been shown him, and he gets his life right with the Father. And his life turns around, and now he goes around ministering, actually, and, and encouraging teenagers in, in their life, and also encouraging drunk drivers and DUI who gets in those situations, they're bringing restoration. So we see that our decision here brings out the character of God. We have a decision to make, are we going to forgive? And if we do, it either brings, if we do or we don't, we don't, it brings the bitterness, the, the foothold of the enemy, there's kind of destruction not only in our life, but in the life of the other, but then also, man, we have the opportunity to show the blessing and the grace of God when we choose to forgive. So our decision to choose to forgive, it begins with a, it begins in our spirit. In our spirit, we says, yes, we know this is true. We know the principle of the Father. We know this is the way of the kingdom. And in our spirit, our spirit cries out to us, Andrew, forgive. Right? He cries out to us in our ears, he, that still small voice, forgive. He urges us to forgive, right? And then we have the choice. All of you, and as we do, the, we know the emotions come with that. Maybe they're a little bit behind. Maybe you don't always feel the most joyous about the situation. Maybe you don't really uh, exactly feel that love. Make the choice and we follow through. Forgiveness is trusting God. The forgiveness is the huge sign of our trust for God. Because like I said at the beginning, unforgiveness is usually, uh, unforgiveness is characterized by our desire to control the outcome of the other person. Now, we don't really want to release them from what they've done to us. Now, we want to hold on to that fence. We, we're actually taking pride, we're actually taking the position of God, and we're saying, no, I'm not willing uh, that they would uh, be forgiven because I know that would release them from the penalty of what they've done to me. As long as I hold on to it, man, it's, uh, they gotta, they got to pay me. But when we forgive, we're trusting God that He will do His part. Right? That vengeance is the Lord's, that it's not mine, that it belongs to Him. We're trusting that God truly is just, and He's going to bring justice to that situation. That's really hard for us. We are just talking the other night in missional community, and we we're, were talking about this. And said, it's hard, because when I see something that's been wrong, I want to make it right. I want to do it. I want to be the one that makes it makes everything get back together. But if I forgive them, if I release them, then I gotta trust that God's actually gonna bring justice to the situation. And as long as I have a hold on to it, then I, I still got control. Right? Sometimes we talk about the, the control issue sometimes, right? But when we release it, we're saying, God, I trust you that you're gonna bring justice to the situation, that you're gonna make it right. I know that it's better in your hands than in my hands. My good friend Linda says this, uh, that bitterness is a poison we drink hoping somebody else will be hurt. <laughs> when we're holding on to unforgiveness in our heart, we're hoping that the other person is going to be hurt, the other person is going to get, get their pay, but we're actually the one that pays for the unforgiveness. to be hurt and to hold on to them. It, it hurts my physical body. Man, it, it upsets the whole environment in my home when I decide to hold unforgiveness in my heart. But we release it to God and we say, God, we trust you. We trust you. You're going to come through. You're going to bring justice to the situation. The other thing forgiveness is, I believe forgiveness is a process. It's not an event. Especially when we talk about some deep things. If we talk about the uh, stranger that cuts us off in the middle of the road and we're upset about that, you know, that, that may be an event thing. It may be a, a one-time thing. But when we talk about forgiveness of hurts, of, of past things, situations in our lives that maybe have been destructive in, in our life, it's a, it's a process. It's not an event. It's not a momentary thing. 
something we work out with God. It starts with that decision, but as we work out, it, it just as Jesus, the Father, forgives us and he restores us to relationship, and we work out our salvation with fear and trembling, this forgiveness thing, sometimes it has to be worked out. Sometimes the hardest thing for us is to make the step towards the conflict. But we've got to remember that the conflict is redemptive. Going towards the conflict, going towards the area of hurt is going to be redemptive. It is risk, it does bring restoration, it does bring hope, it is a demonstration of the gospel. So what do we do now if we find ourselves uh, offended? We find ourselves hurt. In Matthew, there's two different scenarios. One, if you know uh, that you offended somebody. In Matthew 5, verse 23, it says, if you have been, if you know that you have offended somebody, you know that you have caused hurt in somebody's life, it says that you should leave your gift at the altar. It talks about worshiping in a, an altar setting. It says, leave your gift at the altar and go to that person. That's a, takes, that takes some boldness, that takes some honesty in our lives, some examination and say, where are there some people that I know that I've offended? Are there some people that I know that I've, I've hurt? Are there some people that um, are been betrayed by me? And Matthew 5 says, wait, don't do anything else until you've made that right with them. You make a choice to, to, to offer forgiveness. But secondly, in Matthew chapter 18, verse 21 through 27, it talks about the one who is, is offended, the one who has been hurt. And it gives us some steps also. It says, go to that person. Go to them privately and settle the account. Man, and work out this forgiveness thing with them. It does give some other steps if there's still some lack of, uh, of forgiveness, if there's still some lack of reconciliation, to bring some others into the situation and give some wisdom to that and support her. But it, it, it emphasizes here in the scripture to go for it, to go towards forgiveness, go towards the conflict. And sometimes it is true, sometimes we do need somebody to go with us, sometimes it is a hard situation, and I'm not, I'm not saying just go into an abusive situation, back to an abusive situation to bring forgiveness. No, there is some wisdom in bringing some people, and Matthew 18 talks about this also. <coughs> so how do we do this? How do, how do we start with forgiveness? We said um, that there's there's some in the room, and there's some, some real hurts. And I was thinking also, there's, there's some people that, hey, there's people that have offended us or, or hurt me that maybe they aren't on this earth. I can't really set up a time to go with them. I can't uh, write a letter. So, Andrew, pastor, how do, I, how do I reconcile this? Or, hey, the hurt is so real that the emotion is such a big block for me. I know, I, I know I'm making the decision. I'm making the choice today. I'm, I'm taking steps towards forgiveness, but I, I don't know where to start. How do I start this process, bring forgiveness and bring restoration? So today I wanted to close with the start. How do we start? How do we get this going? So I have here a couple sheets of, of, of paper that I'm going to be handing out. But I believe it starts with prayer. See, like I mentioned at a point during the message, that it is forgiveness is not a, always a physical transaction; it's a spiritual transaction. It happens in the spirit. I have to release the person of the wrong that they have done of me. I have to release them back into the Father's hands because He is the one that's going to bring justice. He's the one that's going to bring their revenge. He's the one that's going to make the situation right. I've got to release them to the Father. So how do I do that? I, I, it starts with a with prayer. So I have a, a prayer here for those of us that are gathered that, that I want to hand out, but, but how, how do we pray? So let's go through a couple steps. The first step is I pray that I choose to forgive. So when I open up in prayer, when I, when I find, hey, I, I still have a hurt in my life, I have a situation in my life that's not right, and I open up in prayer and Pray, God, I, I choose to forgive, and I insert their name. That would be 
great job, he's my wife, or I could use uh, a professor, I could use somebody in my family, someone. God, I choose to forgive this person. But it doesn't just start saying, I choose to forgive that. I choose to forgive you for, and I encourage you, when you're talking to the Father, you make it specific. Remember, the, the reason why forgiveness is needed is because there was a specific offense that was undertaken. Uh, so I, I'm choosing, you, choosing to forgive you for, and when I'm praying, I pray out, what God, I'm, I, I'm choosing to forgive this offense. And I, I choose forgive when, when they mistreated me, and when they, when they made me feel like nothing, when, when they just uh, called me a name, and it, it, it destroyed me, and it tore me down. God, I choose to forgive them for that moment. You know what, I, I really encourage and I, I've learned this prayer from, from Linda, from a, a good friend of mine. But the second part of it is, is to be able to release those emotions, to release those feelings to the Father. Because remember, the Father cares for us. He's a good Father. He cares for us. So I, I encourage you to even express, I was really hurt and felt this. And when you're praying to God, say, God, I choose to forgive them for the offense that they had. And this is the way I felt about it. Man, this is the way it affected me. Man, it, it, it lowered my self-esteem. It made me feel like nothing. Man, it, it hurt my heart. Maybe it even hurt me. My, my physical body. Man, it hurt me. It destroyed me. I, I, I felt this pain inside of me. Man, let it all out. The Father wants to heal that. The Father wants to receive that from you. But again, as, we, as we're saying that, and sometimes, let's be honest, sometimes those emotions are going to be real. So that moment in prayer, Maybe it won't sound like that beautiful bed night, uh, bedtime prayer set aside of the bed prayer time, right? Maybe it is a little filled with anger. Those emotions do fall out. I encourage you, when you're praying to the Father about this, let those come out. Let them, let them be revealed to Him. He already knows what you're feeling. He already knows how this um, situation has affected you. Release that to Him. Let it out fully. I was really hurt. But, get back to it. But I choose... I'm choosing to forgive you, and I and I wrote this, have this prayer. Out. I choose to forgive you the same way that God has forgiven me for hurting Him countless times. God isn't asking us to do anything that He hasn't already done for us. So as we release this, as we name what they have done, as we release the way that it is that it has hurt us and the way that we felt, the way our emotions are affected by it, the way our life has been affected by it, we remember in this prayer, but I am choosing to forgive you the same way the Father has forgiven me. And this is an important step also, and, and you don't have to copy word for word the prayer that I'm praying, but this is the important step. What is second is that I'm releasing you to the Father. Again, unforgiveness is all it is, is it's holding on to them, hoping that we can stay in control of them because of the offense they have against us. So it's important in prayer to say, I am releasing you, I can even insert their name, I'm releasing you into the loving hands of Jesus. And this is the hard part. I'm not going to bring up this incident again. Sometimes a prayer, the choice to pray these things, again, it's a decision of our will. It's a decision. This is what it's going to be. And we're hoping that these emotions are going to follow. It's going to flow. This, this, the thing is going to come to completion. So sometimes it's hard for me even to pray that prayer. And I'm releasing you completely. And I'm not going to hold this incident against you any longer. And this is an important second part. So the first part is confessing. I choose to believe this is how you've done, uh, this is how I felt, this is how it affected me. I'm choosing to forgive you, just as the Father has forgiven me. But this is the second part, and sometimes the more difficult part. Father, I pray that you would bless this person, this individual. Because we hold, when we hold unforgiveness, we hold, held a curse against them and, and ourselves. We don't want them to experience the character of God. We hold, and held a curse over them. And so, in opposition of that, now we're going to play, pray a blessing. Father, I pray you would bless that you would use this situation to draw him or her to yourself the same way that you did me. That's a hard step. Second step, that's a hard step. But man, it's going to be good when we can release the blessings of God to the individual.
because it's going to free them from from circumstances. It's going to free them from these things. They're going to be able to experience God. And in that moment that they experience God, we're praying that it would draw them to Jesus. Maybe there's an instance happened, maybe it's between a believer, and those that maybe sometimes are easier offenses to forgive, or maybe sometimes they're hard that a believer is acted outside the, the character of God, right? Man, but we're praying that as we show them the character, as we release them, as they see the God's character in us, man, that it would draw them to the Father, it would draw them to Jesus. Then the, the last step is a little a, little, a prayer of care for myself. Jesus, I give you the pain from this incident. Again, the same thing we just like, so we talked about earlier. We prayed first, we told him how it affected us. But this last step here, this third step is, God, I give you the pain of this. Man, I, I'm feeling this, this pain. I'm feeling this emotion. I'm feeling this hardship. Man, I feel this bitterness. I, I feel down about this. I, I feel like my identity has been, been uh, shamed. I, I feel this. God, I give it to you. I give it to you. I give you these emotions. I give you these feelings. God, I give it to you. And we thank him for dying. We thank him for praying. We thank him because we know that he's going to bring healing into our lives too. This moment that we've carried this unforgiveness is a bitter root. The enemy has had ground. But man, we're thanking God. We're giving it to him. We're giving it back to Jesus. We're giving it to the cross. We pray this. God, I pray that the pain that I felt, the emotion that I felt, the, the way that this has torn me down, I, take, I pray it. I pray it comes out of me and into the cross. That I can receive the healing that you have for me. And then we, and then we, and then I, I, I end the prayer. God, I'm grateful that I can walk in forgiveness and peace. Give me grace to continue in this way. In Jesus' name. Believe that forgiveness starts this way, with a prayer. The confrontation is going to come. I believe there's still moments right for us to go to that individual to make things right. But it starts with prayer. It starts with releasing them into the Father's hands. Releasing them from the from the from the way that they've wronged us, the, from the offense. So we start by saying, "I choose to forgive you for the specific offense," and we t and in prayer we tell God exactly how it's affected our identity, how it affected our emotions, how it affects who we are. Secondly, we pray a prayer of blessing. I bless you, even I forgive you, and I bless you. I release you from all the things that I've held against. I release you from the curse. I bless you. Third, we pray to God, God, would you take it out of us the hurt, the pain, the emotion, the destruction, take it out. Place it with your healing power. I pray these in Jesus' name. This morning, I, I'm, I'm going to pass out this uh, prayer. And uh, I'm going to close in prayer for close in prayer and ask the Father to reveal to us. Maybe he's already been showing us, man, there's these areas, oh yeah, I remember this situation, I remember this, the way that, that I, I've been offended and I haven't quite forgiven that individual yet, I haven't quite forgiven this situation yet, I know he's already stirring in our hearts, so I want to pray that in this next moment, that the Holy Spirit will give us boldness to be obedient, boldness to forgive, and then I want to, I want to pray that we would be a courageous church this morning. Whether you're joining us online, or you're joining, you're here this morning, that we would be a courageous people, and that we would begin to forgive and bring some restoration in the things that have been destroyed by the enemy. So let's pray this morning. Father, we thank you first and foremost because we know that you have shown us so much grace. Father, you have forgiven us such a great debt. Just as the parable Jesus you told that the king, he held against this man a debt of 10,000 bags of gold. But Father, Lord, you showed great forgiveness. But that same man, he went and held against a servant that owed him just a few hundred dollars. hundred silver coins. Father, thank you for that demonstration of what you have forgiven us. Such a great debt. And Father, Lord, I pray now for every individual represented in this church body. 
God, that you would give us boldness to extend the same forgiveness. Father, today we acknowledge the truth. Your word says that if we are unable to forgive from our heart, Father, you would not be able to forgive us. So, Father, I pray for boldness to be obedient today to your word. To begin the process of forgiveness. To begin the process of forgiveness. Father, we pray that we would be people that reflect your character in this world. God, as we work through this time of forgiveness, God, would you give us strength. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to take a moment to pass out these prayers. and I want to encourage you to take a moment to make an altar, to make a place of prayer, to work through these things that God has brought up in your life.